Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Everybody should know where Luke is, right? I, I know Ezekiel's a little hard to find. Zephaniah, that's a little more difficult. But Luke should be really easy. Uh, verse 38. A short reading. Now, as they were traveling along, he entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, for which shall not be taken away from her. Hallelujah. Go ahead and be seated. We've all been in that situation, right? So much that needs to be done. We're going to get back to to uh, Mary, and well, she's the only one that's mentioned, but I'm certain that Martha. And they had a brother named Lazarus. Uh, they were probably there. We've just come off of the two chapters where Jesus lays out what's going to happen in the future, right? Yes. Is, is there anybody more enlightened about what's going to happen in the future than they were before? They wanted to know what's going to happen, and Jesus told them what's going to happen, and yet he didn't tell them enough, really, that they could write a book about it. Say, well, here's how it's all going to play out. Now, how many books are there out there right now that people have written that said, this is how it's all going to play out? Oh, yeah. Right? And probably some of the information is correct, and probably some is not. It's probably some of the information I've told you is correct, and likely some is not. So please don't, when you when you stand before the Lord, say, yeah, Mike told me, <laughs> uh, because we need you to be, I'll be Bereans, and check it out for yourself. <clears throat> be like Martha. I'm sorry, be like Mary. You sat at the feet of Jesus. The disciples wanted to know about the future. Uh, they probably also were, they were very curious and, and kept, you know, talking about our positions. You know, what, what are we going to be doing in this kingdom? And they had this, you know, I, I get it from reading the scripture that the disciples really had this belief that they were going to ride into Jerusalem, and Jesus was going to take over. It was just going to happen somehow. And they were sort of right. That is going to happen, but that's still future. He had something he had to get done. He had to go to the cross. He had to do that. And he kept telling them. It says in Matthew 26, 1, right after he had told them about the uh, the future. It came about that when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. Monica. What day did he have this Olivet Discourse? Uh, now one of the things you should probably understand by now is that the the gospel writers did not put all the uh, segments uh, in, in uh, divinity school you call them pericopes isn't that a cool word pericope 
<laughs> Nobody thinks so. Okay. Never heard Always, of that. yeah. You, if you, like it. Uh, <laughs> Linda likes it. These are the, the fundamental stories that make up the Gospels, uh, the pericopes. If you uh, are typing that in a Word document, it will ask you, Do you don't you mean Periscope? Uh, they don't have that word in the, uh, in the database. But uh, theology professors really like it. But these uh, segments of the Gospel are not always uh, chronological. They are not always put together in the same sequence by each of the Gospel writers. They may have all of the segments uh, in common you know, uh, most of uh, Mark has all the same segments of, as uh, uh, Matthew does, but they're not always in the same order. They put them together for their own literary purposes, the way they want to tell the story. So to say what day did this happen, uh, we can guess Tuesday. So it didn't happen on the day before Passover. He says two happen. days. Yeah, two it days. It didn't happen the night that they celebrated the Last Supper then. It was before that. Right. He says two days, after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. And that brings up the question, is the Passover on Wednesday or was it on Thursday? Probably Thursday, but we're not sure of that. So to try to pin this down to exact timetable, is difficult. Uh, there are a number of timetables, and you know some people criticize them and say, uh, "Well, it couldn't have been like this because of this, or whatever." Uh, fine, not really my main concern. We're going to see here. There is a story that uh, we come to that seems to be this same particular day, whatever it is. But John says it was six days earlier, or six, six days before the Passover instead of two days before the Passover. Uh, notice here, Matthew doesn't say, uh, you know, he, he says that, uh, right after his Olivet Discourse, he says after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man is to be delivered up for crucifixion. We could assume that everything else in this chapter takes place on this same day, but maybe not. Maybe Matthew is just putting these together for his own literary reasons. And Matthew didn't know where the breaks were going to be in the chapters anyway, so... He didn't know that. No. But it says that somewhere around this same time, we don't know uh, if it was this same day or not. It says then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas. And they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying, not during the festival, lest a riot occur among the people. They didn't want it to be on the same day that Jesus predicted. They also didn't want to, you know, the... Uh, High priest served at the pleasure of the Roman procurator. Uh, and he served as long as he could keep the people in line. That was the main thing. Keep in line, pay your taxes, don't cause trouble. Everything will be okay. Right? Isn't that what all despots want? Peace, security, pay your taxes. Do what we tell you. John gives us a little more information. John says in chapter 11, verse 47, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? Uh, in that uh, great commentary, Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, I think uh, Caiaphas says, uh, How does he put it? You know nothing at all. Or we need a more permanent solution to our problem. This man is performing many signs. Messianic signs. 
signs that by their own traditions would say this man is the Messiah. You know, but he comes from Arkansas. Well, that's that's kind of how they thought of uh, Galilee, you know, the way we would think of Arkansas. He's a gypsy. You know, he's just he's not one of us. He's not like us. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nations, our positions, you know. The procurator appointed me, and I appointed you, and, you know, it's all going to fall apart if we let this guy keep going the way he is. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest at that year, said, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. John adds this little comment. He says, now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. John is saying that that God is respecting the office of high priest, even though the man occupying it is a scoundrel. And John says, and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they plan together to kill him. Once again, this seems like it's just, you know, while Jesus has come into town for uh, the Passover festival, that this, that's when they held this meeting. It's likely true, but we don't know exactly when. But the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders of the people had an expectation of what the Messiah was going to be like. And he was going to be one of them. They might even get to cast votes for him, right? They might even get to elect him. But they were expecting a kingly Messiah. The disciples also were expecting a kingly Messiah. They thought that they were going to ride into Jerusalem, they were going to take over, Jesus was going to point them to all the, the best uh, positions, uh, everything was going to be peachy after that. Even Judas expected a kingly Messiah. Judas, through the time he spent with Jesus, apparently believed that he was the Messiah. We'll get to his motivations a little bit more later, but he just wasn't performing like the Messiah should. Well, they had some reason for believing that the Messiah was going to behave a certain way. They had uh, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, that they were all familiar with. They memorized huge portions of it from childhood. You know, portions like Isaiah 9, it says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Uh, the us, us here is Israel, not uh, uh, Europe. And the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So all those Folks like Simon the Zealot and the fictional Ben-Hur who were practicing getting ready to uh, uh, perform an armed revolt on behalf of the Messiah, they were, they were all disappointed <clears throat> because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. In Ezekiel 37, 24 says, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances, and keep my statutes, and observe them, 
and they shall live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons, forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. And they both acknowledge that the Messiah, in some way, as the descendant of David, would fulfill this, this promise. And Jesus himself seems to confirm that he is the king. Uh, of course, we have the birth narratives, first of all, that say that he's the fulfillment of what we just read. Uh, and Jesus confirms it, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and he's going to judge the nations. Jesus acknowledges for us that, yes, he is the king. But he's got work to do. He's got something to accomplish before he can sit on the throne as king. He didn't admonish uh, James and John when they asked for the best uh, places in uh, Mark 10.35, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now Matthew tells us that it was actually their mother that came and asked on their behalf. Uh, <clears throat> and he said to them, Well, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right and one on your left. Jesus, Jesus never said, well, that's not ever going to happen. He just said, those are not positions for me to grant. When that happens, the Father has already decided who is going to have those positions. But it tells us in Matthew 16, 21, where the disciples had just acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He didn't understand that there was something Jesus had to do. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Peter was thinking materially, politically, worldly. He hadn't set his mind on spiritual things yet. In fact, throughout this whole thing, the only one that seemed to get what was going on is Mary. It tells us in Matthew 26 that when Jesus was at Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, so evidently they're having a dinner in Jesus' honor. There's a number of people there. It doesn't tell us how many. Uh, but they're probably out in the courtyard, the way uh, homes were built, especially, you know, fairly, you know, upper middle class kind of homes, which it kind of seems like these folks were. Uh, Simon the leper was probably a relative or a close friend of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And they were having a party for Jesus in the house of Simon. And it says, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume. It tells us in John that this woman, who Matthew doesn't identify, but John tells us that it was Mary. Mary comes to him. Uh, and she poured this oil Matthew just identifies it as costly oil. John, once again, gives us more information, says it is spikenard. 
Spike, spike nard only comes from the Indus Valley, uh, which is a long way. So, uh, just among everything else, it takes quite a uh, quite a bit to just transport it from the Indus Valley to to uh, Israel to Bethany. So it would seem that Mary and, and her family are probably fairly well-off merchants. They're not pe people living in po I'm sorry, poverty. But she came with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume and she poured it upon his head as he reclined at the table. But the disciples were indignant when they saw this. Of course, John tells us that Judas was the one who was most indignant and says that this uh, perfume might have been sold for a high price. John tells us 300 denarii, which was like a year's wages for the average person, and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed for me. She's done a beautiful thing, as most of the translations say. For the poor you have with you always, but you do not always have me. There are a number of people that would have us believe that the number one issue within Christianity is charity, giving to the poor, that Jesus was ultimately concerned for the poor. And Judaism in general is concerned for the poor. There were a number of things written into the law regarding how the poor were to be taken care of. But Jesus said, we're not ever going to get rid of the poor. Yeah, it sounds harsh, but you get rid of the poor when they're not poor anymore, right? You know, we, uh, I think it was around 1967 or 68, declared war on poverty. Poverty won. Uh, some people in poverty are in poverty at a higher level. Uh, than they were previously. But most of what has uh, transpired has not really helped very much. It helps the people in poverty to stay in poverty more conveniently. And that's not, you know, that sounds harsh, uh, but it is to a large extent true. There are exceptions. There are uh, always the stories of people who have escaped poverty and then there are the stories about other people who because of their foolishness and irrespons irresponsibility have sunk into poverty and this happens frequently but the main point is that Jesus is not primarily concerned about people's financial status. We have had a number of people show up here at the church. They don't want to come to church here. They don't want to be part of our fellowship. They want a handout. And sometimes we give them a handout. And sometimes we don't. Uh, I get calls all the time and I tell people, well, I don't have access to the church's funds. Uh, the elders have to make that decision and for, you know, for uh, anybody to receive uh, a benefit from the church, they have to come and fill out a form and talk to the elders and how many have shown up? Two or three? But the idea is that the thinking out there is that churches exist hand out stuff for the poor. And indeed we do that. 
but we ask people to be responsible. And a great many of them don't want to be responsible. They just want the handout. But Mary is the one who understands that her relationship with Jesus, what he is doing on her behalf, is the primary thing. Jesus said, For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. When Jesus said, I'm going up to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested by the elders of the people, I'm going to be handed over for crucifixion, the disciples didn't get it. They, oh, he must be speaking figuratively, right? Mary understood. She understood that this was her opportunity because people who were crucified did not receive a proper burial. And that was important in Jewish thinking. So she takes this alabaster vessel of oil and pours it over his body. We call this anointing. We go back into the Old Testament, we see a number of cases where someone is anointed, especially for a specific task. We see that Samuel anointed Saul as king. And later he anointed David as king, right? The word anointed is Mashiach, Messiah. Saul was referred to as the Lord's Messiah. David was also referred to as the Lord's Messiah. While Saul was still reigning as king, David respected the office that Saul held. He said, I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Messiah. So the word Messiah in Hebrew is equal to the word Christos in Greek, Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus says, she did this to prepare me for burial. And truly I say to you, whenever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done shall also be spoken of in memory of her. We don't speak of Mary too often, do we? Not that Mary. <laughs> uh, but this story of her anointing is, is important. It should be part of the gospel story. Uh, well, why? Well, because Jesus, the Messiah, is the anointed one. Uh, in Luke 4.18, it says, Jesus uh, said in the synagogue, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's quoting from Isaiah. Uh, because uh, he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He was anointed for this task. Is he chasing them off? I think he was just scratching. Oh. There's somebody sitting out there. But this... There is someone sitting out there. There is a uh, point. It's Debbie. It's Debbie. Okay. <laughs> Debbie for Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Jesus, we're, we're told it comes in the roles of prophet, priest, and king, which is difficult uh, from the uh, Jewish standpoint because priests come from the tribe of Levi and kings come from the tribe of Judah. But Jesus is the 
prophet, priest, and king. So at one po what point did his prophetic role end and his uh, role as priest begin? And I would conjecture that it was right here. Jesus has just finished with his uh, Olivet Discourse, which is the grand uh, prophetic vision of the kingdom. And that role is over. He is entering his role as priest. As priest, he offers himself and his blood on our behalf. Aaron was anointed, it tells us in Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. The, the anointing of Aaron. Hebrews tells us about priests and how Jesus is the superior priest. It says uh, in 723, the former priests on the one hand ex existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. They had a period of time in which they could function as priests and then somebody else had to take over. But he, Jesus on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. So he began his priesthood at this moment. He was anointed by Mary as priest. Now, if you were a, a Jewish writer, and you were writing about the anointing of the Messiah, you would probably uh, write about how he went into the temple and had hands laid on him by all of the, uh, uh, the priesthood and uh, then was anointed by the... Uh, the current high priest, and uh, no women would be involved, right? If you were writing this, you know, as a uh, uh, from, from a Jewish standpoint, but that's not how it happened. Jesus was anointed by Mary. <clears throat> Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession. For him. So not only did he offer his blood uh, on the cross and in the, uh, the heavenly tabernacle, uh, but he continues to make intercession on our behalf. It was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. This is the work of the priest that Jesus has set out to accomplish. In some circles, it's kind of fashionable to think of Jesus going to the cross as a great tragedy. And yet, it was a great accomplishment. Because that's the only way we can be saved. There's nothing we can do on our own. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. Made perfect forever. And the other person that had a messianic expectation was Judas. You know, he followed Jesus, thinking he was the Messiah, probably thinking, well, come on, Lord, when are we going to get on with it? Maybe if I do a little prodding, maybe if I'm the one who turns him over, that'll kind of force him 
to act. That makes the most sense of any uh, motivations, you know, possible motivations of Judas that I've ever heard was that he really thought that by uh, putting Jesus in this situation that he was going to have to uh, use his power uh, to overcome the situation he was in. But he didn't. And one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to deliver him up to you? And they weighed out to him 30 pieces of silver. You know what 30 pieces of silver signify? The price of a dead slave. If where, where it's mentioned in the law is if uh, you have an ox and he kills, your, your animal kills your neighbor's slave, you have to pay him 30 pieces of silver. So the nation of Israel reckoned the price of their Messiah as the same as for a dead slave. And from then on, he began looking for a good opportunity to betray him. So we have all these different views of who Jesus was who Jesus is. And the only one who really got it was Mary. And all she could do was, as the song says, sit at your feet and weep. Jesus, when he began his ministry, he said, he says he began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, we think, well, repentance means being sorry that you're a sinner. And that can be involved, for sure. But the greater meaning of repentance is understanding that I was born into a world that is in rebellion against God. And rather than be than aligning myself with the principles of the world, those principles and institutions that are in rebellion against God, I'm going to turn around. I'm going to acknowledge that those principles and institutions are wrong, and I need to follow Christ. I need to align myself with God's plan, not the world's plan. We should always remember that charity, while an important thing, is not the primary thing. The primary thing is coming to repentance ourselves and leading others into that thing we call repentance, into that love relationship with our Savior. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we uh, come before you and we acknowledge that uh, we are uh, people of unclean lips that live among other people of unclean lips, as Isaiah said. And that we need to just come before you, lay it before you, uh, <clears throat> and live our lives uh, to the best of our ability in uh, relationship with you and understanding that uh, that is uh, our salvation. Help us, Lord, on that road. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.